Well, good morning. Good morning. Welcome to worship on our female Sunday here at U Park Hall. Try to throttle back, try to dial my voice back a little bit. As we begin our fall programming for the year, I'm Andy Dunning. I'm the pastor here at U Park. If this is your first time worshiping with us, or if it's your first time in a long time, I want to extend a special welcome to you. I also want to welcome those of you who are joining us online on our YouTube channel or live on Facebook as we worship here in the sanctuary. I hope that all of you will stick around for our lunch and our celebration after the service. We have games for kids and great food by Painted Bench Catering. Some of the folks from the Cornerstone two class helped us set up out there and they said they were just going to stay out in the parking lot and play on the bouncy obstacle course before the kids got it uh, after worship. So we're very glad to have you worshiping with us this morning. Our vision for ministry here at U Park is to be an intergenerational, diverse, radically inclusive Christian community where families and individuals can thrive. Now, this has been a busy week for all of us. I know the school year is getting started. We start our fall programming this week. And I want to acknowledge the hard work of our church staff that they've put in preparing for today's celebration, as well as the enthusiastic help of all the volunteers who showed up to help us this morning. I, I do hope that you all remembered that we changed our worship service to 11 this morning, and it's going to stay that way at least through May. In January, we'll be adding a second worship service at 9 o'clock, and we'll have more information about that over the next few months. But even as busy as we all get, I think that worship is still the most important thing that we can do as a faith community. Worship is our time each week to gather, to turn ourselves intentionally and consciously toward God, and to open our hearts toward experiencing God's presence in whatever way that happens. I hope that our worship reminds us of who we are, reminds us that each one of us is made in the image of God that we see in each other and in the beauty of God's creation around us. I hope that in our worship, we are reminded that we are God's beloved, that this is God's world, and that there is always hope and joy to be found in God's quiet faithful, steady work among us. So whoever you are, whatever you may believe or question or doubt, you are welcome here at University Park United Methodist Church. I'll be in the lobby after the service and then shortly thereafter going out to the parking lot to enjoy lunch and each other's company. If you'd like to know more about the church or you just want to say hi, I would love to chat with you. I want to invite Bethany Hader Krabs forward. Bethany directs our Ministry of Congregational Care. She's going to tell us about a few things that are going on in the life of the church over the next few weeks. Good morning. It's good to see all of you today. We wanted to let you know about a celebration of life for Charles Arnoldy, also known as Chuck. That's how I knew him was Chuck Arnoldy. Um, it will be this Saturday, September 17th at one o'clock, um, so that we, we hope that you'll come and join us in honoring his life. Starting next Sunday, we will have a new um, opportunity during the Sunday School Hour called Connection Hour. So if you are not currently a part of any of our Sunday School classes, um, you are welcome to come to join us for Connection Hour. We'll have refreshments and some questions just to discuss with one another to kind of build our community, get to know one another better, and again, offer another opportunity during that Sunday School Hour. And then coming up on September 25th, our youth group will be doing Pixar Putt-Putt. So we will be doing that event with uh, Wash Parks, uh, UMC's youth group. So we hope that you will join us at 4 p.m. for Pixar Putt-Putt. Mark your calendars. During this part of the service, I always ask a question and invite you to stand and share with your neighbors. If you don't want to stand up, that's fine. You can sit where you are. You don't have to participate, but it's just a way to get to know each other better. So today's question is, what is a dream that you've had that came true? And just to share a little bit about your experience with that. This, um, the one I'm going to share didn't quite come true in the way that I thought, but when I was a kid, I wanted to be a zoologist or a park ranger. Those were my things I wanted to be. And I um, had the opportunity in my mid-20s to go and work in national parks for a few years. So even though I wasn't working for the park service, I kind of got to experience what it would be like to live out in the, in the wilderness and be able to hike the trails anytime. So I invite you to stand and share about a dream you've had that came true.
please rise as you're able and join me in the call to worship. It is a good day to be here. It is a good day to tell stories. It is a good day to give thanks. It is a good day to ask for help. It is a good day to be in community. Please remain standing for our opening hymn.
Today's scripture reading is from Exodus chapter 32, verses 7 through 14. The Lord said to Moses, Go down at once. Your people, whom you brought up out of the land of Egypt, have acted perversely. They have been quick to turn aside from the way that I have commanded them. They have cast for themselves an image of a calf, and have worshipped it and sacrificed to it, and said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. The Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people, how stiff-necked they are. Now let me alone, so that my wrath may burn hot against them, and I may consume them. And of you I will make a great nation. But Moses implored the Lord his God, and said, O Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people, whom you brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians say it was with evil intent that he brought them out to kill them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from your fierce wrath, change your mind, and do not bring disaster on your people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants, how you swore to them by your own self, saying to them, I will multiply your descendants like the stars of the heaven, and all this land that I have promised I will give to your descendants, and they shall inherit it forever. And the Lord changed his mind about the disaster that he planned to bring on his people. May God bless the hearing and understanding of these words. Let's pray together. Lord God, we gather here today for many, many reasons. To find joy, to celebrate, to seek consolation, to grieve. We gather to find community, and perhaps most of all, we gather to know your presence. We do not gather to hear my words, but rather yours. And so I would ask that you speak to each of our hearts the words that you would have us hear in our worship this day. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. For you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. You know, before I start this sermon, I just want to say I'm so glad the choir's back. (laughs) It's so great to have you all. You sound terrific. Nice job, Joanne. Wonderful job, Renee, Steve. So today is the third Sunday in our sermon series on discernment, which is a term with a very long history in Christian spirituality. Discernment refers to the process of seeking God's will for our lives, of knowing God's will, of being guided by God. Throughout history, and even back into the Jewish roots of our faith, there's been lots of writing and thinking and spiritual practice centering on this idea of discernment. So the first couple of weeks of this sermon series, I talked about two kind of general principles of discernment. The first is especially important, I think, in our present society. We live in a world, maybe you've noticed, that is absolutely soaked in anxiety. We are drenched in it. We are constantly being urged by one event or another, by one person or influencer or another, constantly urged to be upset or angry or fearful about all kinds of things, most of which contradict each other, right? It's the liberals who hate America. They're the problem. Or maybe the fascists who are trying to take over our country. It's them. Or the dire consequences of climate change. Or maybe it's inflation or Antifa or the oath keepers or the job market or inflation or gender fluidity or the lack of gender fluidity or the war on Christmas or whatever it is, there's always some collection of people who think we should be angry, upset, and afraid all the time. Now, there are a lot of problems that arise from that state of mind, and I'm sure you could name some of them, but for people who are trying to follow Christ, people who are really trying to pursue any kind of spiritual life, one of the worst problems that that state of mind brings about is that God's voice tends to be quiet and small and subtle. If we're trying to hear God, it helps to get quiet inside. And that's hard to do when the voices of anxiety are constantly yelling at us that we're in some existential crisis and we have to act right now or everything we love will be destroyed. 
That's a great message if you're trying to scare people into doing what you want. It's a lousy message if you're trying to listen to the voice of God. To discern God's will, we need to practice laying down our anxiety and quieting our inner noise so that we can be still and know God. Now, that doesn't mean we don't have concerns. Obviously, we do. It doesn't mean there are never any existential crises because they, they happen. It doesn't mean we're never anxious. Anxiety is just a part of life. But if we practice getting quiet and listening carefully, we become more able to respond thoughtfully and intentionally rather than out of a fear-driven, knee-jerk reactivity. Now, last week, I raised this question in the process of discernment of how we know that we are doing God's will. What are the kind of guardrails, right, that keep us on the right track? In his first letter to the church at Corinth, the Apostle Paul is wrestling with that question. And his answer is that in this life, in the conditions under which we all live, we never know, at least not for sure. We never know fully the outcomes of our decisions, the way that what we do affects the world for better or for worse. Paul says that at best, in this life, we see a dim reflection of the true and complete picture of who we are and all that we've done. We can't ever make out all the specifics. That's just part of being human. But in the end, Paul writes, if we live out our lives in faith and in hope and in love, we're not going to go too far wrong. The 13th century theologian Thomas Aquinas called faith and hope and love the theological virtues. He said that there were other virtues, virtues like courage or self-control, and they can be developed by our own will and practice and commitment. But faith and hope and love, Aquinas said, those are gifts from God, and they in turn help us grow closer to God. God works in us to make them possible, and as we live by them, we develop deeper relationship to God. We become more like Christ. Now, I find Paul's words about faith and hope and love reassuring for two reasons. First, if he's right about this, then it means that there's not just one right answer we have to find to whatever question we're asking and that everything else is wrong and out of step with God's will. That's not the way it works. If we make our decisions in faith and hope and love, we'll be okay. We'll make mistakes, for sure. We're human, right? We always make mistakes. But our mistakes won't be irreparable. They won't be irredeemable. The second insight for me is that the more we practice discernment, the better at it we get. The better we get at living by the theological virtues of faith and hope and love, then the more faithful and hopeful and loving persons we become. And in that process, our lives gradually come true to the flow of God's Spirit in and through us. Now this morning, I want to talk about a third principle of discerning God's will. And in some ways, I think it's actually one of the hardest to do. If we're going to ask for God's guidance, truly ask, and if we're going to truly mean that we want to know what God's guidance will be, then maybe the most difficult thing we have to do is to be willing to consciously, intentionally set aside the answer that we want, and instead, commit ourselves fully to hearing whatever may arise in the process of questioning. Years ago, I knew this guy. He was a singer and a piano player. He was pretty good. And somewhere along the way, he became convinced that God had called him to be a professional Christian musician. He had some songs written. He put together a band, and he made some recordings. He started booking Sundays at churches as like a guest musician to play and kind of get his name out. He booked some concerts and music festivals, touring in kind of small venues around the region. And this went on for a number of years, that same sort of set of concerts and small venues, that same recordings that he was shopping around, but he just never really gained any traction. Gradually, the people in his band went on to other things, as happens, right? They had non-musical careers of their own. They were engineers or construction workers or whatever they were. They got married, raised families. And as time passed, my friend began to be kind of angry about all this, kind of bitter. His faith became more extreme. It had this sort of fanatical edge to it. If someone in his band had a professional or family obligation and couldn't make some upcoming gig, he'd accuse them of putting other things ahead of God. If people suggested to him that, you know, 
Maybe this whole touring Christian concert musician thing wasn't working out. He'd get mad. He'd tell them that they were trying to separate him from his true God-inspired calling. Now, not surprisingly, people felt alienated and hurt by this, and he became increasingly isolated from people who at one time were trying to support his venture. I don't know what's happened to him in the years since, but as far as I know, he never did realize that dream. Now, of course, I've got no idea what was going on in his inner life, and it is absolutely not for me to judge. His spiritual life is his own. But I do think it's possible. I think it's possible that my friend experienced something that is very, very easy for any of us to do, which was to get his own desired outcome mixed up with how God's Spirit was leading him. That passage that Brian read for us this morning is part of an episode from the book of Exodus, which is the story of the Israelites escaping from slavery in Egypt. Historians think that the events that are described in Exodus probably happened 1,200, maybe 1,300 years before the birth of Jesus. And if you've hung around church as much, or if, like me, you're of a certain age and you've seen the 1956 Cecil B. DeMille movie, The Ten Commandments, I won't ask for a show of hands, um, you're, you're probably familiar with the story of the golden calf, right? By the way, as usual, spoiler alert, the book is better than the movie. The, the, the DeMille movie actually changes some of that story, which I always thought was weird, and I never could understand why they did it. But anyway, what's happened so far in the book of Exodus is that the great prophet Moses has led the people out of Egypt, where they were being held as slaves. They're traveling through the desert on foot, and Moses has gone up a mountain to talk with God and to do some discernment of his own. But at this point in the story, now Moses has been up there for days and days, and the people waiting at the bottom of the mountain are beginning to think that, you know, maybe he just kind of went out for cigarettes and he's never coming back. So they go to Moses' brother Aaron, and they demand that Aaron make for them what they call gods to go before us. So Aaron tells them, hand over all the gold they have, and he uses it to cast a golden statue of a calf which the people then worship and say, these are the gods who have led us out of Egypt. So as we heard in today's reading, God catches wind of all this, and he tells Moses to go down the mountain immediately. God threatens to kill all the people, wipe them out, and make Moses the sole ancestor of the new nation. Moses manages to kind of talk God down, talk God out of destroying the people, and then he goes down the mountain to straighten things out. Now, clearly, the people have done something wrong in God's eyes. God is so angry that he's ready just to wipe them all out and start over. But here's the question that occurred to me as I read that 32nd chapter of Exodus over this past week. What exactly, what exactly did the people do wrong? Obviously something, but what? Now, I think the classic explanation of this text is that they committed the sin of idolatry, which is the practice of worshiping anything that is not God. They want a God they can see. They want a God that looks and functions like the gods of the cultures and the people in the region around them. Gods that are symbolized by statues of powerful animals or forces of nature. They want something miraculous to happen. So instead of just waiting, they just decide to make one themselves. If you've ever read this part of Exodus, you might remember that when Moses does come down from the mountain to confront them about this, Aaron, his brother, kind of embellishes the story. Actually, he doesn't kind of embellish it. He just outright makes something up. He tells Moses that they just sort of tossed all their gold into the fire and miraculously out came this calf. He's creating the story of a miracle where in fact none existed because in the people's fear and desperation, that's what they want. Instead of allowing themselves to be formed by God, the people have formed a God of their own. Now that's the classical explanation of what the people did wrong. But I wonder, I wonder, what if idolatry is not the disease, but rather the symptom? What if the object of their worship is not a golden calf so much as a symbol of their own desires, their own needs, the outcome that they want. See, I think in one way, the story of the golden calf is a textbook example of how to do discernment wrong. 
The people are driven by anxiety. Rather than trying to detach from it, take a deep breath, set, down, set their anxiety down, and seek God, instead, they go to Aaron, and they demand a quick fix that makes them feel better, a God that looks like something they might have seen back in Egypt. Rather than trying to act in anything that looks like faith or hope, or love, they abandon Moses and in the process turn their backs on God. Rather than releasing their own desires and waiting patiently for God, they push for their own preconceived solution. And God says to Moses, they have been quick to turn away from the way that I commanded them. Now I know it is really easy to look at this story and to find it ridiculous, right? They want a God, so they make a little statue and they worship it. It's absurd. But there is an old saying about the Bible that I've probably mentioned before in sermons, and that is, if we think a Bible passage is not about us, we've probably misunderstood it. This is not just some ancient story about silly people worshiping a statue. I think this is a story of people who make an idol out of their own desires, an idol out of their own preconceived notions, rather than patiently awaiting the urging of God. It's a story about people who allow their anxiety and their fear to push them into a solution they already want, rather than allowing something new and creative to emerge from courageous and open, patient, awakened hearts. We are all, all of us, I think, nowadays, encouraged to identify with some tribe, with some ideology, or maybe a set of tribes and a set of ideologies. So, you know, we're Republicans or we're Democrats or we're liberals or conservatives, we're gun owners, we're pro-choice, whatever it is. Each one of those tribal identities carries with it some set of angrily prescribed answers to society's problems. But it seems to me that if our primary identity, if our primary identity is as the people of God, then all of those other identities with all of their pat solutions and all their righteous outrage begin to look suspiciously like golden calves. And we begin to look like anxious Israelites wandering around in the desert, too scared and too impatient to await the gentle voice of God. That waiting, that discernment stuff, it's slow. It takes time. It takes patience. In a culture where everyone is constantly losing their minds about the latest existential crisis, many will accuse us of being weak or indecisive or ineffective, which is, of course, exactly what they said about a crucified Messiah and all the people who followed him all those years ago. Let me invite you.
I want to thank you all who have all of you who have contributed to our school supply drive this morning and over the past couple of weeks. Just to fill you in in case you haven't heard about that, we've been conducting this drive this year in conjunction with a network of teachers around the Denver metro area who work with children whose families have no homes. So these are homeless children who may not have access to the kind of school supplies that they need to get a proper start to the school year. So I, again, I want to thank everybody who's brought school supplies so far, and I just want to encourage you, if you haven't done it yet, there is a list of needed supplies on our website and on our Facebook page. You can check those out and bring the supplies here to church over the next few weeks. We've got a bin out front in the lobby. You can just drop your supplies off there, and we will make sure that they get to that network of teachers and into the hands of the kids who need them. I want to thank you for your generosity because that school supply drive is just one example of the ways that this congregation has a heart to serve the community and does that so generously generously and so well throughout all the year, not just when school is beginning. If you'd like to make a contribution to our ministry today, you can do that by dropping a check or some cash in one of the offering plates that are at the back of the narthex, or if you'd prefer to give online, you can go to our website at uparkdenver.com. That's uparkdenver.com. Just click on the giving tab that you'll see there and follow the instructions before you. Let me invite you to stand and let's join in our final hymn, Sing of the Lord's Goodness. The words will be here on the screen. In the bulletin, it should say verses 1, 3, and 4. The screen does indicate that. Sing of the Lord's goodness, Father of all wisdom, come to Please be seated. In your bulletins and on the screen in front of you, it says that we're going to take a moment to recognize Patricia Clark's ministry. I'm sad to share with you that Patricia is very, very ill and she is home today, so she was unable to be with us. But I wanted to make sure that you all heard the, the, about the letter that went out this past week. Patricia is going to be leaving our congregation. She's going to be the new youth director at Littleton United Methodist Church. Now, obviously, I'm sad to see her go. She was a great hire and she's done terrific work here not only in our children and youth program, but working beyond that. I don't know if you've noticed these little graphics that we have to advertise upcoming church events every week. Patricia designs those. She just kind of whips them out and puts them up. She maintains our Facebook page. She has made changes to our website. She's been a terrific presence to have not only on staff, but in our staff meetings where she asks very observant and thoughtful questions and keeps us all moving forward toward the vision that we have for our church. So I want to acknowledge 
her tremendous work here. And although I'm very sad to see her go, and I know so is the rest of the staff, we celebrate the fact that she is moving to a wonderful church, Littleton United Methodist Church, as I said, much bigger congregation than this with a much bigger youth program. And I know that she will do terrific work there. She'll also be right down the street, so we'll see her every now and again. But anyway, I just wanted to take that moment to recognize Patricia and the work that she's done. If you have the opportunity in the coming week, I'm hoping that she will be back in the office in the next few days. Friday will be her last day with us. So if you want to send her an email or give her a call this week just to chat with her, I know that she would really deeply appreciate that. She was looking forward to being here today and sharing what was to be her last Sunday with you. Now this week and in the weeks to come, I pray that you are blessed with the patience and the strength to set aside your own preconceived notions of how God may be calling you. May you have the courage to respond to God's creative whispering to your spirit. May you be open to hearing something surprising. And may the peace of Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all, now and forever. Amen. Thank you.